Welcome to Hope Awakens, coming to you from It Is Written, just outside Chattanooga, Tennessee. I'm John Bradshaw, delighted to welcome you. You are joining people from around the world in this series. I'd like to greet Connie in Alberta, Canada, Jackson in Panama, Central America, Rick in Owasso, Jonna in Australia, Dottie in Maryland, Anne in Nebraska, Thomas in Washington, Randy in Missouri, as well as friends in Ghana, West Africa, Cat Island in the beautiful Bahamas, and also in the Philippines. In Hope Awakens, we're making sense of the moment and finding hope in what's a time of real challenge for all of us. We're in this together, and together we're about to learn more that will help us to see behind the scenes and make sense of what's coming. Thanks so much for being part of Hope Awakens. I'm John Bradshaw from It Is Written, and these are unprecedented times we're dealing with. Lockdowns, illness, job loss, insecurity of all kinds. We've been concerned for the welfare of our families, especially the elderly, those with underlying health challenges. We ought to know by now, wash your hands, which by the way, has always been really good advice. Cough into your elbow. Don't mingle with people if you are feverish. Now we're practicing social distancing. We've adapted to a new way of life where in many places in the world right now, you can't go to the supermarket as you used to. Many businesses are closed. Many services are unobtainable. A friend said the other day he's had his car waiting at the mechanics to be fixed for, he doesn't even remember how long. It's just that there's nobody to fix it right now. Now, before we go any further, I'd like to share with you some resources that will make this study journey even more beneficial for you. So be sure you visit hopeawakens.study slash resources and you'll get free resources that will enhance your study time and help you to get the most out of this experience. And I wanna thank you for submitting questions. You'll understand we'll, we'll never be able to get through all of them, but we'll do our best to get through as many as our time allows. So get your questions to hopeawakens.com slash questions, hopeawakens.com slash questions. And with that, I want to welcome to Hope Awakens, my good friend, Doug Naag. Doug, welcome. Thanks for being here. Hey, John. It's good to be here. Also to with our viewers at Hope Awakens, we've got some very good and interesting questions. And so I'm really looking forward to the answers. This one comes from Kathy. And Kathy asks, what does the Bible teach about uh, God uh, allowing this world to go through all of the things that we're going through? And Why didn't he just fix it from the beginning? Ah, Kathy, good question. I'm going to give you a pretty good answer. Not right now, but in just a few moments. Tonight's presentation deals with that very thing. So hold tight, Kathy. That's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Good question. Okay, so this one, John, comes from Mike. God says, it is not good for man to be alone. I have prayed for many years for a mate, and yet it has not been answered. So... How can you say God always answers prayer when this one has yet to get an answer? Or are you going to take the easy way out and just say he is saying no? Well, (laughs) that's a good one. I don't know that that would be the easy way out necessarily. Okay. Did you say this is from Mike? That was Mike? Yes, this one's from Mike. All right, Mike, I got an answer for you. I'm not going to take the easy way out. First John chapter five, and we're going to start in verse 14. First John 5, 14, it says, Now this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, what word did I use right there? I think it was the word anything. Mm-hmm. He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of Him or that we desired of Him. So, God says, ask and you shall receive. So you've asked for a life partner and so far, no life partner. Now, what we don't know is is your age. I guess that's not really material, but um, maybe. Here's the thing. God knows when the time is right. We don't. We tend to want what we want now and think that now is the time, forgetting that there's always a tomorrow. So I'm going to counsel patience. Claim the promises of God. 
Now, Mike, I don't want to step on anybody's toes. We certainly don't want to get too personal here, but maybe there are other reasons. I mean, are there, are there ways that you could, please don't take this wrong, I don't know you or your situation, but are there ways that you could make yourself uh, more ready for a life partner? Here's what you want to do. Take these moments that you have now to invest in your life and make yourself the kind of person that the right person would say, that's the one for me. You know what I'm saying by that, aren't you? Don't you? So, so don't get frustrated with God. God's doing what He ought to do, how we ought to do it, when He ought to do it. What we don't do is use prayer as a stick to beat God into submission with. We say, not my will, your will be done. For reasons we don't understand, some people remain single for a very long time. So keep praying, keep believing, let God be in charge of timing, you be in charge of you, and prepare yourself to be the sort of person that should somebody marry, you would enhance their life and lead them closer to Christ. That's all I'll say right now. That was a good answer. (laughs) Uh, This question here is from Aaron. Aaron uh, says, where can I get the same Bible as Pastor John Bradshaw? I love it, I like it. It looks like it has a lot of additional commentaries. Okay, well, here it is, right here it is. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you the truth, it doesn't have a lot of commentary in it, and there's a reason for that. Uh, I'm not against um, commentary as such, but the Word of God is the Word of God, and even the best commentary is only a commentary, someone's best ideas. So careful when it comes to commentaries, but what this does have is a, a little concordance, a little one, they can be a little helpful or a little frustrating, depending. It has uh, another book of the Bible called the Book of Maps. It has that right here, and then uh, a little something else. So not too much in the way of additional. If you want to get it, the only place I can tell you to get it is itiswritten.shop. I'm sharing this with you because uh, multiple people have already asked. So itiswritten.shop, you'll find it there, and it's a good Bible. Open it up, you read it, it reads well, and it contains, it is the Word of God, so I like it. Thanks, Doug. Next question. Here's uh, this one is from Jordan. From what you were saying about a new normal, do you know what it could be? Oh, yeah. We mentioned that last time, didn't we? Uh, After this whole thing settles down, the world could be in for a new normal. Uh, No, I don't know what that means, really. I just know that things could be different. I'll give you some examples. Um, I'll give you you a couple of hopes of mine. I hope after this, sick people stop going to work. That would be really good because that's how the flu spreads. And when you get the flu, you don't tend to be as upset about it as someone who gets coronavirus, understood, but it's still an awful indignity for somebody to, 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 to foist their flu upon you. So perhaps we'll be a little more careful about that sort of thing. Perhaps uh, people will be a whole lot less tolerant, and I'm not saying this is a good thing, if you're sitting on a crowded aircraft and the person behind you is coughing, coughing and won't stop, There's going to be a lot less patience with that. I I imagine people will wear masks more than before. And I don't know, but uh, there may be some other things, uh, a little more intrusive, a little more ominous. I don't know. I I, I probably shouldn't speculate and I don't need to speculate. But when this settles down, the world might be a little different a place. I'll share with you one other thing about spreading germs. If, if, If you were with me, I could take you by the hand a very, very long way, It's not here anywhere near I am. I could take you to a residential care facility where during the last flu season, nine elderly residents died. And they died because they contracted the flu and they weren't able to fight it off. Wouldn't it be good if people started taking a little more care now and said, oh, this stuff is actually deadly. Uh, I should be a little more careful about where I take my germs. So I've talked about, I think, some positive changes and there might be some positives, Maybe some not so positives. We'll see. That's a good one. Kenny asks, how can I keep doubt from entering my mind? Oh, good question. Kenny, let me tell you, you cannot. How do I keep doubt from entering my mind? You can't and you needn't. The question is, what do you do when doubt comes into your mind? So I'm not sure what doubts you're talking about, but maybe it's doubts about the existence of God. Well, you open the Bible to the very first page of text and it says, In the beginning, God. There are more than 31,100 verses still to come. The first one says, God, God exists. 
you turn to the very end of the Bible. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all right there at the end of the book of Revelation. Uh, Revelation 22, 21. Go to the Bible. You're not going to keep doubt from entering your mind, but what do you do with doubt? Continue to revert to the Word of God, yield to the Word of God, stand on the Word of God like Jesus did. And we'll see tonight how Jesus gave us an example in doing that. Don't worry about doubt. Uh, you know, it's a little bit like water running through a, a crack in a wall. It's going to keep doing that until you seal up the crack or divert the water. You can't stop the rain from falling, but you can seal up the cracks and let the Word of God seal up the cracks inside your mind. You don't have to have a dumb faith. You can have an intelligent faith. I believe because of this and this and this and this and this. You can have a confident, intelligent faith. Let the Word of God be the answer to your doubt. This is God's Word, not mine. It's not yours. And you can be confident in this and let the Bible uh, take care of any doubts as they occur to you. You will find when you get more confident, and you just keep fending off doubt with the Bible, those doubts are going to surface a whole lot less frequently. Nancy asks, My heart has a conviction to spread the gospel, but due to health issues, I'm not able to be in the company of others at this time. How can I share the gospel without me being in person? Oh, Nancy, great question. So you're aware of a, of a, of a web address, hopeawakens.com. Take that and share it with everybody in your inbox and say, you don't want to miss this. You just witnessed. You are going to have interactions with people, whether it's over the phone or whether it's the, the FedEx person dropping off a box or the times that you go out of, of the home. You're going to interact with people. Let Jesus shine out of you and look for opportunities to speak a word in His behalf. Uh, you can use the telephone, the internet, email, texting, you name it. There are still lots of ways that you can share your faith. And Nancy, I'm encouraged that you would ask such a question. Thanks for doing so. This is a question from John to John. All right, John, let's have it. <laughs> what is the best answer for someone who asks, where or who do pestilences or plagues come from? It seems that God sent the plagues on Egypt. What about in the end of times? Is it God, Satan or self? Yeah, that's a good question. I'll tell you what, tonight, again, I think we started with the question where I said we'll answer it tonight. Uh, this, was this our last question? Yes, this is our last question. All right, so our last question, I'll say the same thing. We're going to answer that question in tonight's presentation. Thanks very much. And you know what to do if you have questions. You get them to us at hopeawakens.com slash questions. I'm pretty certain I've got it right. Hopeawakens.com slash questions. I think I do. And I am grateful. Our presentation tonight is entitled The Unseen Enemy. We're going to begin tonight by speaking to a guest, someone I've known for many years. He served in the United States military for 20 years. He was a sergeant major and his name is DK Kim. DK, thank you. Welcome to Hope Awakens. Uh, good to be with you, John. I really appreciate it. Okay, let's begin with your time in the military. Our subject tonight is the unseen enemy. And any military knows plenty about uh, finding the unseen or avoiding detection. It's important in the military. What can you tell me about that? Well, John, it's been over 25 years since I left the military, so it won't do justice for me to talk about what goes on these days, but we'll try to share from my own perspectives and experiences in the past. Uh, one of the most important aspects of consider uh, to consider when planning for the war or battle is the element of surprise. Commanders can execute this uh, element of a surprise by inserting highly trained small units or teams uh, way behind the enemy line, infiltrate them deep within the enemy territory to gather information, intelligence, um, disrupt the lines of communications, or destroy critical targets of importance for the main objective. To accomplish such a task, these small units must uh, move without being detected. Simplest way, uh, blend in well by uh, camouflage properly. You don't want to wear a desert camouflage pattern in the jungle or vice versa. Or, uh, of course, 
move at night in hidden and also a total silence while moving. I you appreciate can also it. use Sorry, go right ahead. I'm, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Okay, you can also use a different infiltration method such as using scuba techniques or uh, free fall techniques uh, behind the enemy lines. However, the most important thing to consider is to simply blend with the surroundings, uh, minimize unnecessary movements, and stay silent that no one suspect you are there. Interesting when you consider where we're going with tonight's presentation. Now, you were in the military, and by the way, Thank you for your service. Your nation is grateful to you and others like you. I want to extend my very sincere thanks for your time serving this country. Now, you're serving in a different capacity. You are now a chaplain in a hospital, a Soin Hospital in Beaver Creek, Ohio, part of the Kettering Health Network. Now, first thing, and be, we can be brief about this. What are the hospitals telling us we ought to do about the coronavirus? It's unseen and it's an enemy. Give us a reminder of some of the things you are hearing the hospitals say we need to do. There are a few things I think you already mentioned, many of them. Uh, simply social distancing. Keep the distance between the people. Uh, frequent washing of hands. Um, wearing a mask. Because you just can't see this virus and we want to prevent as much as we can by taking this uh, simple, necessary measure to protect ourselves and other people. Okay, now in your role as a chaplain, there's something that you deal with on a daily basis that you cannot see. It's an unseen enemy, and that's sin. Now talk to me about this, this spiritual battle that we're in. Yeah, the, some of the unseen enemy that I experience as I visit patients is the, some like a anxiety or fear, you know, anxiety of um, what's going to happen in the future after amputation of a foot. A fear of unknowns waiting on the biopsy results. But most dreadful thing as a chaplain that I see is a, a problem with the sin, uh, which that created all this anxiety and fear. And uh, some of the patients who share such a predicament I pray with them for forgiveness and God's grace. Uh, but most of all, that I pray with the people for the, our compassion that God will bless them with the healing and a comfort and peace in their healing journey. DK, I appreciate you taking your time to be with me. God bless you in your role as a chaplain. Again, thank you for your service. I really appreciate you being with me on Hope Awakens. All the very best to you. Thank you, John. Glad to be with you. It's 2020. And we have a pretty good idea as to how people get sick and to a degree, to a degree, how people get well. But it wasn't always like that. Not much more than 100 years ago, heroin was being marketed as a treatment to treat coughs. In children in the late 1940s and early 1950s, lobotomies were routinely practiced. The word lobotomy itself tells you all that you need to know from lobos, lobe, part of your brain, and tomo or tome to slice, lobotomy, brain slicing. The man who originated the practice won a Nobel Prize, a controversial decision to say the least. Oddly enough, lobotomies were performed to treat mental disorders, but of course they did a ton of damage. I read where one writer said his mother had a lobotomy when, when she was 33 years old. He said after that, she could no longer taste or smell. He said, she drank like a fish and cursed like a sailor. And she said and did whatever entered her mind. Lobotomies are now thought of as one of the most barbaric mistakes ever perpetrated by mainstream medicine. At the time, we thought they were good. It was once thought that bloodletting treated illness. It was thought long ago that being ill meant that there was an imbalance, an imbalance in the four humors in the body, as they were called, humors, blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile, whatever that is. Letting out some blood was thought to bring balance back to the body. George Washington, first president of the United States, asked for bloodletting to be performed on him in 1799. Doctors took almost four liters of the president's blood. Not sure if you realize that's almost a gallon 
Unsurprisingly, he died not long after. You see, we had funny ideas once about what caused illness. That's because of things like culture and tradition and the fact that we didn't have electron microscopes or computers or Google. In fact, until the end of the 19th century, it was thought that diseases such as cholera or even the Black Death were caused by something called miasma, bad air coming from a rotting organic matter. But slowly over time, medicine caught up with the idea that diseases spread by germs. In the 1860s, Louis Pasteur conducted a series of experiments on the relationship between germs and disease. As a microbiologist, he believed that many diseases were spread by tiny organisms invisible to the naked eye. He disproved the theory of spontaneous generation. What is spontaneous generation, you may ask? Well, it's the idea that little creatures such as fleas or maggots just simply came into existence out of dust or dead flesh, just came out of nothing. And that was good science once upon a time. It's no surprise people used to believe that as unlikely as it sounds to us today. Without microscopes, how could they know otherwise? And if you're not looking for something, you're not gonna find it. But Pasteur looked and he found, and he's regarded today as one of the fathers of germ theory. He wasn't the first to propose the idea, but he developed the idea, brought it into the public eye and into general acceptance. Pasteur was convinced that there were little things that couldn't be seen. He said, the fact that we can't see them doesn't mean they're not there. That's how pasteurization came to be. He believed that microorganisms caused things like milk to spoil, microorganisms. And he believed these tiny micro, is, he believed microorganisms caused people to spoil. He believed and he proved that something you cannot see can do great damage. Something you cannot see could spread disease. But now we believe that, don't we? We believe in germs and viruses. That's why we wash our hands. It's why we don't appreciate people coughing or sneezing in our space. It's why we are grossed out, shocked even by those videos that show how far droplets spread. We've come to believe that our health is affected by things that we are unable to see. So let's consider the times in which we live. We understand viruses now, little things that avoid detection for so long because we cannot see them. But I'm gonna take you a step further. Let's look into the spiritual realm. I'm gonna start there by sharing with you a parable, a story told by Jesus of Nazareth 2000 years ago. Look at the story, you'll find it in the Bible, in Matthew chapter 25, we start in verse 24. We will read through to verse 30. Another parable he put forth to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheats and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, an enemy has done this. The servants said to him, do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, no, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now, this was no joke. The weed was most likely bearded darnel, lolium temulentum. When it's young, you can't tell the difference between the weed and the seed, or between the weed and the wheat, I think is what I wanted to say. So it was a nasty thing that was done to the landowner. And the stuff is poisonous. You wouldn't want to eat it. Dangerous. Let's look at this story. Something awful was done. Something nox noxious was sown. And Jesus said, an enemy has done this. Okay, think with me. You've likely heard all manner of explanations regarding the origin of the coronavirus. You have heard it was developed in a lab in Wuhan, China. You've heard it had something to do with bats. You've heard that 5G wireless communications technology is linked to the coronavirus. People have vandalized 5G towers. You've heard that Bill Gates is tied up with it all. Now, my point isn't to tell you that these things are right or wrong. I think you can figure that out. Although I think we all know that wireless towers transmit wireless signals 
and not viruses. But my point is this, or should I say Jesus' point is this, behind sin, behind ruin, there is an enemy, an unseen enemy. Behind every virus, behind every fatal accident, behind every death, there's an unseen enemy. And we can say an enemy has done this. A lot of people are seeing stuff and looking for explanations in the wrong places. 25 years ago this month, April 1995, the Alfred P. Murrah building was ta- targeted in an attack in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. It was a disaster. 168 dead, including 19 children younger than six years old. If you've not seen this memorial, stop and see it. It's powerful and moving. More than 500 people were injured. The president at the time was President Bill Clinton, who labeled the perpetrators of this horrific crime as evil cowards. Except that in some minds, evil doesn't exist. Some will say the idea of evil does. But evil itself, it is said, a myth we've created about ourselves. One author, an atheist, says that the concept of evil is not only a meaningless concept that adds nothing to an understanding of human behavior, but he says it's also a dangerous one because it obscures possible understanding of events. In other words, there's no evil. A couple of days ago, there was a tragic chain of events in Nova Scotia, Canada. This is a beautiful Nova Scotia sunset that you were looking at. A columnist in the Toronto Sun described it as calculated and evil stuff. President Ronald Reagan labeled the Soviet Union an evil empire. George H.W. Bush, President Bush, spoke of the axis of evil. I'll ask you this, was Adolf Hitler evil? Some people, including some neuroscientists, say no. Now, I'm not asking if everything about Hitler was evil or if people could or could not be redeemed. But do we see evil there? And if, it do, if we do, where does it come from? Where do viruses come from and car accidents and murder and cancer and racism and terrorism? Where do they come from? Where does ethnic cleansing come from? Jesus said, an enemy has done this. The challenge with trying to look behind the scenes is that we come at this with some preconceptions and we run up against some hard questions. Questions we can answer, yes, but questions that turn some people inside out. And here's one of those questions. This really is the big one. How can there be a loving and omnipotent God if that God still allows evil in the world. If there's evil, and if there's a God, and if they co-inhabit this world, then God evidently cannot stop evil, and God therefore is clearly not omnipotent. Now, this isn't just your neighbor asking these questions. These questions aren't being asked by dummies. Stanford University and other very respected institutions of higher learning ask and wrestle with these same issues. We're going to work through this one. We know that the Bible says that God is love. We know that. Most famous verse in the Bible, John 3, 16, says that God so loved the world. God said through the prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah 31, I have loved you with an everlasting love. So we see here that we've got a loving God on the one hand and death and mayhem on the other. How can we recognize these two disparate concepts? I think we can. We struggle with our own sense of justice or right and wrong. You see, when a second grade teacher is killed by a drunk driver, we, we, we just can't get our minds around that. A child develops cancer and we think, That's just not fair because it isn't. The tendency is to blame God. Where was God? After all, He's all powerful. Surely He could have stopped that car from running a red light. He could have stopped that man with the gun or guns. A couple of years ago, one man armed to the teeth killed 59 people in Las Vegas. More than 400 others were injured. Where was God? Could God not have allowed rain to come before the crops failed owing to drought? 
The question is, why did God not stop these things? Okay, we're thinking. You go to the beach and you might see flags warning you not to swim in a certain place because there's a dangerous undercurrent or rip. You can't see it, but beneath the water, there's a strong current that could take hold of you and drag you far out to sea. The danger is there, but you can't see it. It's hidden. It's hidden in plain view. If you really want to know where COVID-19 came from, I'm about to tell you. Let's go back to the beginning and let's be sure we consult this book, the Bible. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the world was good. No one got sick. No one got drunk. There was no domestic violence. There were no cemeteries in the world then. The plan was that Adam and Eve would live forever. Genesis 1.31 says, Then God saw everything that He had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Very good. But we know what happened. It was the oddest thing. We pick it up in the third chapter of the Bible. We read this. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And He said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? The serpent tempted Eve to eat the fruit that grew on the knowledge, no, grew on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what did she do when tempted? So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sowed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And how did that play out? One chapter later, one chapter, now Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. So we have death in Genesis 4. Six generations later, same chapter, then Lamech, took for himself two wives. Now we have adultery. The name of the one was Adar. The name of the other was Zillah. Four verses later, same man, Lamech, says, Adar and Zillah, hear my voice. Wives of Lamech, listen to my speech. For I have killed a man for wounding me, even a young man for hurting me. The wheels fell off pretty quickly. Lamech's son, you know who he was, Lamech's son was Noah, and we know what happened in Noah's day. Genesis 6, verse 5, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Verse 11, The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. In fact, the same chapter says, The Lord was sorry that He had made men on the earth, and He was grieved in His heart. So why did all this happen? Here's why. Look back with me in Genesis 3, 14. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. Notice what God said, because you, Satan, have done this. God identified the cause of the trouble. An enemy had done this. God identified that enemy. Okay, where'd this enemy come from? Well, the answer is the last place you would imagine. The Bible says, and war broke out in heaven. This is Revelation 12, starting in verse 7. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. You would not expect there to be war in heaven. That's almost incomprehensible. We don't know exactly what kind of war this was, not likely a war with guns and violence, more likely a war of ideas, a political war, 
a whisper campaign. It became a smear campaign. But there was war there in heaven, disruption. So why? Why? Why war in heaven? Well, if you go to the book of Isaiah and open it up to chapter 14, you find God tell us why. Starting in verse 12. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I, Satan said, will be like the most high. Ezekiel sheds a little more light on this. He says, you were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God and I destroy you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. For reasons I don't know that we could ever understand, Lucifer wanted to sit in God's place. I, 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 he wanted to receive worship. That's what the record says. When he wasn't able to receive worship, he rebelled in heaven, was evicted, then came to the earth and proceeded to introduce mayhem to this planet. And he was successful. He need not have been, but Eve made the mistake of choosing to ignore what God had told her. You'd expect, wouldn't you, that God would have warned Adam and Eve, gave them all the help they would need by telling them, don't eat the fruit on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But when the heat was on, Eve forgot or she chose to forget God's plain counsel. She no longer yielded to the will of God. And as a result, sin entered the world. Sin brings death with it, Romans 6, 23. The reason being, according to the prophet Isaiah, is that sin separates a person from God. Life is found in God. You pull the plug on the toaster from the wall, no toast. Separate from God, no life. It says of Jesus, in him was life and the life was the light of men. That's why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life in John 14, 6. When God appeals to us and pleads with us and warns us, He does so because He's a loving parent. You tell your children not to play on the road because you care about them. Don't touch that hot thing. Stay away from the neighbor's angry dog. Don't climb on that thing. It isn't because you're wanting to ruin your kid's life. You're trying to enhance it. Parents know what's best. God knows what's best because ultimately you are going to listen to one or the other of two voices. So now we know why there's trouble in the world. An enemy has done this. First, induce the human family to not trust fully in God. Then slowly but surely lead them further and further away from the will of God. In your lifetime, you have seen colossal changes in society. It wasn't long ago and the Bible was widely accepted as valid and containing important guidance, vital guidance for society. We printed In God We Trust on our money in the United States because we by and large believed that. But the Bible's been under attack in recent years. Now even many theologians describe or deny the plainest teachings of the Bible. No, I don't know either why they're employed as theologians. Why is that? It's because the devil is campaigning, working to undermine God's authority. It's fashionable to think that faith in God is for the simple-minded. And of course, nobody wants to be thought of like that. I spoke with the PhD and asked him about faith in academic circles, the circles in which he moved. He told me this. He described himself as a recovering atheist. He said, peer pressure. When everyone believes in a certain way, in this case, that God doesn't exist, then you learn to go along with that way of thinking or else your career prospects might suffer. It's exactly what he told me. Just think about how the world has changed in only the last 20 years. The prevalence and the availability of sin. Church attendance declining in many, many areas. 
the number of atheists and agnostics and nothings going up and up and up. It's the result of a deliberate campaign to undermine faith in God and separate people from God. Evil exists in the world and and it really does because the architect of evil is determined to do lasting damage to this world and to the people in it. People God loves. He wants you lost and hopeless. So we have a situation in the world where there's an enemy hiding in plain view. Everyone sees the problem, death, disaster, disease, but our tendency is to think that this sort of thing just happens on its own without there being something going on behind the scenes. You know, when the stealth bomber was developed, it was a big deal because, because of, well, because of stealth, low observability. And if you've ever seen one of these magnificent machines flying, and you might have if you've been out near Whiteman Air Force Base in Western Missouri where they're housed, you'll have seen that the stealth bomber blends in with its background. Its surface absorbs radar, making it difficult to detect. It cleverly minimizes the amount of heat it gives off. Part of the stealth bombers or parts of the stealth bombers are covered in advanced radio absorbent paint and tape. And because of the way the plane is shaped, radio waves bounce away from the place they're being sent from rather than right back to where they're coming from. They're incredibly engineered. The whole point is so they're not easily detectable. They can be right there and you can still miss them. Let me give you another example of stealth, a little different. The Underground Railroad was established to help enslaved African-Americans escape into free states or Canada. It's being suggested that in all, well over 100,000 people escaped via the railroad. Of course, the Underground Railroad wasn't underground and it wasn't a railroad. It was described as being underground because people who disappeared into it were just gone, like the earth had swallowed them up. Probably the best known figure associated with the Underground Railroad, Harriet Tubman, responsible for helping more than 70 individuals to become free. It operated right out of the heart of slave states, right under the nose of the fugitive state uh, slave law, transporting those looking for freedom between 10 and 20 miles a day, most days. It was happening right out there where it couldn't be seen. You can hide things in plain view, you know, The devil's done a masterful job of hiding himself and blaming God for everything wrong in the world. So why doesn't God just stop sin? Well, for one thing, you need to remember that God does already prevent more calamity than we could even know. But imagine if God just stepped in and said, no more sin, no more evil, no more accidents. I'm stopping it all. Now, someone's thinking, where's the downside? Oh, no. God loves you too much to do that. Mm. In order to stop drunk driving, God would have to physically prevent people from buying alcohol and from making alcohol and from selling alcohol. God would have to remove that from every human being in the world. In order to stop most cases of lung cancer, God would have to do the same with tobacco, get rid of it. In order to stop racism, God would have, God would have to do what? What would he do? Well, whatever the magic solution would be for that, It means that God would have to stop someone from thinking their thoughts and committing their actions. That's not what God does. And you don't want God to do that. You know, God gave humanity freedom of choice. He made us in the beginning free moral agents. It's why God says in Isaiah chapter one, come now and let us reason together. He could have said, you sit there and listen to what I say and just do what I tell you. But God doesn't say that. Do you really want God to remove freedom of choice from everybody alive? You wouldn't be a free moral agent then. You'd be, you'd be a robot. You wouldn't have a mind of your own. You wouldn't have freedom. Slavery would be back, except it would be worse than slavery because in this case, the slave master would be omnipotent. I want you to see where this is going. By the time Jesus came to the earth, the devil was even trying to separate Jesus from his father. You might recall the story when after Jesus was baptized, the devil visited him in the wilderness and said, command that these stones become bread. Jesus answered with a line I like an awful lot. He started by saying, it is written. See, those were very good words. It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So Satan tempted him again. 
throw yourself off this pinnacle of the temple and the angels will catch you before you hit the rocks down there. And Jesus answers, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. But watch the third temptation. Again, the devil took him up uh, on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Do you see that? It's that desire for worship, which explains what we're seeing in the world today. An angry fallen angel, desperate and determined to get on earth the worship he wasn't able to get in heaven. And let me just pause a moment to say this. When you get over into the book of Revelation, the Bible speaks about the devil in earth's last days and says that all that dwell upon the earth will worship him. So you see what he's doing, separating us from God so that we lose our faith and our trust in God, so that we decide that God is a maniac who floods the planet just to kill people and get a thrill. And we turn away from God and follow after the enemy. So no, murder isn't God's doing. Don't blame God for that or starvation or for injustice An enemy has done this. You want God to step in and stop it all? You're asking that God take away your free moral agency and make you a robot. Satan tells us the same lies today as he told Eve in the Garden of Eden. You will not surely die for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good and evil. Did you see that? He says, God is keeping something from you. God isn't fair. Today, we still have freedom of choice, but look around and you can see a lot of people aren't exercising that freedom in harmony with good common sense or with God. You're free to drive a car. With that freedom comes the responsibility to drive it appropriately. Don't drive under the influence of alcohol. Do obey the road rules. You can fly a plane, but we're hoping you won't fly one into the side of a building. You think it was risky giving human beings freedom of choice? Well, not if they surrendered that to God. But what was the biggest risk? You see, everything would be fine unless something went wrong. And what could go wrong? Sin. And if sin happened, what then? Look at this. In the book of Revelation, we read that Jesus was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That means that heaven was prepared for sin. If it happened, Jesus would come into the world to die for sin so that sinners could live. The one who assumed the risk in this thing was God. God would have to give the most. God would be separated from a son whom he had been with since eternity past. God would have to clean up the mess we made. He'd have to bear our guilt, our shame. He'd have to watch his own son be treated indescribably cruelly for things that he never did. In fact, Jesus came to the world to demonstrate love and he received hate in return. He came to bless others and they nailed him to a cross. He gave his life for a world that rejected him. Don't forget even for a moment what God did. Woman taken in adultery, Jesus forgave her. World was destroyed in Noah's day. God had given them 120 years to repent. Jonah went to Nineveh with a message of judgment. Y'all are going to be destroyed. Nineveh repented. God took a different course of action and Nineveh was not destroyed. Nineveh was profoundly wicked. I'm not even going to tell you what the Ninevites got up to. David was a murderer and an adulterer and a liar. God forgave him. Manasseh was so wicked, you're not going to believe it. Sacrificed his own children to pagan gods, yet you will see Manasseh in heaven. What we have in God is a merciful God, a loving God who showed that over and over again. Look at the cross. Look at Jesus on the cross. And you think God made grandma die? In November of 1975, a massive freighter called the Edmund Fitzgerald, which was named after the chairman of the board of the company that owned it, It sank during a terrible storm on Lake Superior. The ship was carrying iron ore pellets, thousands of tons. It was the largest ship on the Great Lakes. When she went down, all 29 crew on board died. 
A month later, the Canadian folk singer Gordon Lightfoot recorded a song called The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. And in that song, remember, it's about men perishing in a shipwreck in a terrible storm. Lightfoot sings, does anyone know where the love of God goes when the waves turn the minutes to hours? Listen to that question he asks. Where does God's love go at a time like that? What happened to the love of God that this tragedy could happen? You get the implication. And that belief has been drilled into our minds. Where did the love of God disappear to at a time like that? Of course, God's love is constant. The presence of a tragedy is not a reflection on God or on the love of God. It's a reflection of the fact that we are caught in a battle, a spiritual battle in this world. God is love according to the sacred record. That's always true. There's an enemy who wants you to think otherwise. Remember what the Apostle Paul wrote to the Ephesian church. He wrote, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places. He says, there's a spiritual war going on. It's serious. We are in the fight of our lives. What we're looking at is a great conspiracy. You've heard the conspiracy theories that float around. I'm gonna tell you about the biggest and baddest of them all. The greatest of all conspiracies, the conspiracy theory everyone ought to hear about because it's the one that can be believed 100%. Satan has conspired against God. In this conspiracy, he's gone on an all out attack against the character of God. He has rubbished God, denigrated God, criticized the Bible, blamed God for the very things that he has caused. And incredibly, most people have swallowed the lie. Does God cause hurricanes? No, an enemy has done this. Does God cause house fires and cancer and fetal alcohol syndrome? No, an enemy has done this. There's a battle going on, a spiritual battle. Every few years ago, a country has a general election, most countries. You get to vote for members of parliament or Congress or Senate, or you get to vote for president. There's a presidential election in the United States later this year. You get to choose who you want to see in office. It's the same spiritually. There are two great powers in this universe and you get to choose which power you want to align yourself with. Look, rather than sin in the world causing you to think God isn't good, it would be right for you to look at tragedy and say, this is evidence that the devil isn't good. Someone has hijacked God's world. Rather than running from God, rather than running from this great good God, loss and sadness and death ought to cause us to run to God. Get angry with God and you're upset with the wrong person. That's for sure. I remember being in a hospital counseling room 25 years ago, almost to the day. My father had been experiencing ill health. Still in his 60s, you'd think he was too young to die, but we don't always get to pick our time. I was there when the doctor said to my father as kindly as he could, I'm sorry, Mr. Bradshaw, there's nothing more that we can do. I looked at my father and he had this, this look on his face. It, it was sort of disbelief mixed together with, I don't think I heard you right, doctor. My father asked a question I will never forget. He said, so you're telling me I'm going to die. The doctor had been asked that question a few times before. All he said to my father was, we'll keep you as comfortable as possible, Mr. Bradshaw. That was an interesting drive home. We all know that one day we're gonna die. But my father had just had his death sentence read to him. He was going home to die. My dad was a man of faith. He'd done his best to remain a faithful member of his church all of his life, and yet now he was going home to die. God did not lengthen his life sooner than anyone would have wanted. But I'll tell you this, my dad's faith never wavered, never, not even once did he blame God for his unfortunate situation. Never did he charge God with being unjust. Now don't get me wrong, if, if you or someone you know has a hard time receiving that kind of news, I'm not faulting that, anguish is understandable. My father wasn't happy to hear this news. He was as disappointed as anyone, but he didn't see it as unfaithfulness on God's part. I've never forgotten that. His faith stayed strong. He turned to God for strength. He didn't turn on God. 
How are you doing right now? I know there are many people who are doing great. That's good. This, this strange new world we're in is for some people just an inconvenience, maybe even a minor one. But for others, it's tragic. More people died today. More families are grieving. I heard today of several different healthcare workers who are heading into the teeth of the storm, going right onto the front lines to join the other, other admirable people who are there treating the worst affected. Some of those people are very concerned. Their families are concerned as well. But the truth is God is good. He's always been good, always will be. But as important as knowing that is, entering into that is better. I take you back to 1975, Hobart, Tasmania, Australia, 9.30 at night, January the 5th, middle of summer in the Southern Hemisphere. An enormous cargo ship transporting iron ore hit a bridge, a bridge that went over the Derwent River, caused a 73 meter long section of the bridge to collapse, 240 feet long. Four cars drove off the end of the bridge and plunged 150 feet into the water below. Two cars were left dangling over the end of the bridge, their occupants managing to escape with their lives. A man named Murray Ling was driving across the bridge and noticed lights on the bridge go out in front of him. He thought something's wrong. Then he saw the taillights of cars in front of him disappear as those cars plunged off the bridge. He braked as hard as he could. His car stopped just inches from the edge, but another car coming up behind him rammed him pushed the front wheels over the edge, and there the car teeter-tottered. Mr. Ling and his family got out, and then they realized other cars were heading for the 150-foot drop, so he tried to get the drivers to stop. A bus filled with people skidded to a stop, crashing into the railing on the bridge. Two cars ignored him and raced past. One of them actually paused and swerved to get around him, drove around, looked at him like he was crazy drove off the end of that bridge and the occupants of the vehicles of the vehicle perished. He tried to save them. Some were saved. Others ignored the appeal to stop, the appeal to be saved. In fact, Jesus spells out the problem of the masses today when he says in John 5 verse 40, but you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. Jesus came into this world to give us life more abundantly. That's what his own words said. I have come to give them life and that they may have it more abundantly. Now and in the future. You know, when this whole coronavirus thing is passed, over, done with, when the challenges that we're now facing are just a memory, what will your life look like then? When that kingdom we talked about last night or last time is set up, where will you be? Only God can save us from where this world is headed. Only Jesus can give you new life now. God is good. An enemy has done this. Let's pray that our hands will be in God's hands. Let me pray for you now. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful tonight that we can reflect on your word and see it's a faithful account of what's happened down through history. An enemy has done this. So guide us to commit ourselves to you. Tune us towards the good, the great God, and hold us always in your arms. We thank you tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope you'll be sure to get your study materials, get your questions to us, shared with you earlier how you can do that. And be sure to join me tomorrow night. We've got a great subject, heroes in a time of crisis. Heroes in a time of crisis. Don't miss tomorrow night. More from Hope Awakens. <laughs>